Let's take ourselves off mute. Hopefully you've muted the stream on your desktop. I, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I have, yeah. <laughs> Give everyone a headache. <laughs> but yeah, no, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, we won't start just yet. We'll give it a couple more minutes. Um, before we do do start, though, um, I just want to quickly apologize, really, for the last event. Um, it, it was really disappointing because um, leading up to it, you know, never did I envisage or experience in the countless streams I did before that, you know, OBS crashing out on me and then lots of packet lost by my internet provider at the end. And it was just, I know I don't have much to be sorry for because something like that you can't help, right? Internet yeah, providers be internet providers, but I just felt really bad because Matisse did such a great session and it was at such a great moment when it started packing in. So yeah, I'm sorry for that, but fingers crossed that we'll be good in this session. It'll all be fine. And if it's not, then it'll all be fine still. <laughs> It's not a problem. So, do you want to share the? Um, you want to share my screen? Yeah, sure. I'll try and just tell people what we were we were just chatting about. Chatting about desks. Chatting about desks. Desks. Yes, Graham. We are live. Although, although Adam and I are more live than you because it actually ends up just a little bit behind for you guys. But yes, so we were chatting about. Let's. Let's do a zoom. Oops, let's not do a zoom on that page. Let's do a zoom on this page. Then you can actually see what's going on. Look at that. So that's Troy Hunt's desk. That is unreal. And that middle monitor is a 49 inch beastie. And the other two on the outside are both 27 inches. There's a whole bundle of real estate there to do your work. So we were, we were just chatting about that because- It's just so pretty. That, it's unbelievable. <laughs> that monitor in the middle alone costs, I don't know, like fifteen hundred quid, I think. Yep. So he said, "Well, what's what's what your looking like?" And I was like, "There you go. That's mm. that's where I am right now. So I am literally standing at my standing desk in front of that, and I've got two thirty-eight inch um, monitors. I've got the Elgato light. I've got the backlight, which isn't actually. Oops." The light is extremely on, difficult yeah. to get hold of now. Yes. Obviously, yes. because of obvious reasons, but... Everybody wants to be streaming. Um, and it, it is it is fantastic. You'll notice that I'm on this and not, not using this uh, lovely boom mic that I've got because the problem is, as those of you who've seen me present before, is that I generally tend to move about and those boom mics don't like it if you move about they like <laughs> you to be precisely where you should be <laughs> so i gotta have a i gotta have a headset on no worries which is which is fine it's fine well you're coming through loud and clear for me so good 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 let's do oh, should we do that Let's do that, but actually let's put it on that one. There I think because of the aspect ratio of your monitor, it's coming across more, uh, what's the word? Rubbish? No, it's not rubbish. It's fine. It's just, <laughs> just a bit more narrow, I think. It's a bit narrow. All right. Well, we can yeah. fix that. We can fix that. It's not perfectly uh, square, if you see what I mean, like the, the 16 by 9 sort of aspect ratio. Whoa, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> Let's change this from all of those. Um, yeah, that res is like two 1440s put together, right? Yeah, it's nice. awesome. <laughs> um, Perfect. Yeah, that, that feels a lot better. And I'm just thinking about the viewers as well. That's all. Hopefully, it doesn't throw you out too much. Though. Let's see. Oh, and it, has, it has for a minute. Is it? It's, yeah, it's completely throwing its toys out with Pram at the moment. Let me stop sharing mm. and let it re I mentioned its... earlier that you have a million um... lanyards behind you as well. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case I you thought... want to wake up and be someone else, I guess. <laughs> I started off um, like you're excited when you get a, um, you get a session and you're like, oh, I've got a lanyard. Look at this, I've got a lanyard. 
So, I, you know, I kept them. And then I kept them and I kept them and I kept them. And I had all of these lanyards. And I was like, what am I going to do <laughs> with these with these lanyards? And um, that's just not working for me at all. Oh, hey, I mean, if it's too much trouble, just go back at the res you were at and then we'll... No, I'm going to come, I'm going to, come to a different one. We'll try that because it's totally not yeah. not working. Let's try that. Why do you do that every time? You go over there, you go over there, now I restore this and it comes over here because... Because. <laughs> and then we can put that over there. Oh, my goodness me, that's me. Um, <laughs> now I've lost Zoom. I've thrown um, you out now. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said anything. No, it's cool. <laughs> it's, I, I've had worse things happen. <laughs> uh, screen one. Your screen one. So we share you. And with a bit of luck. Ow. Yay. <laughs> nice. Uh, still doesn't look awesome, does it? Looks better on my screen. Doesn't look quite as good enough. Is it good enough? What do the viewers say? For me, it Crystal looks good. Clear. Yes. Good, good, good. Um, let's do a quick sanity check of something like this. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's good. That's very good. That, yeah, I can read that. Yeah, we like that. Good. This is a book. That's how a book gets written in VS Code. Mm, more or less. What are you writing? Um, uh, we're writing DBA tools in a month of lunches. It's, oh, yeah, um, I think I saw a tweet for that. Yeah. Yeah. So if we do this and you do beer.media slash book, he said, possibly not remembering his own short oils. Oh, yeah. There we go. It's a Manning book. Da -da -da -da. So it's in a meep, which means that Manning thinks that Chrissy and I are going to finish it. And <laughs> the last three or four months, Chrissy and I have been blatantly not finishing it <laughs> because COVID and work and, you know, Chrissy moved jobs and then moved house. In fact, moved country. So, you know, that makes, makes life a bit interesting. But... What do you reckon? Shall we get shall we get on going? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, let's get yeah. started. You happy with that? Oh, someone awesome. just come in and said, uh, "Rob, do a short version of DBA tools in a week of coffee breaks." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would, that would work, Alan. I think um, I'd be like, "Hey, it's DBA tools. It works with SQL Server, right?" There we go. Uh, tomorrow will be yay. You can use. Uh, Find dash DBA command to find all new commands. <laughs> Done. <laughs> work work our way through like that. That would be awesome. <laughs> right. I ain't no data scientist. Why do I need stupid notebooks? So hands up, any data scientists in the room? Oh yeah, I can't see you because it's all virtual because COVID. In fact, yeah, actually, yeah, we ought to be. Um, we'll do this thing better, really, shouldn't we? So we we better make sure that. Uh, and this is how we're supposed to. <laughs> All um, all interaction should be with masks because oh no, that's right, Nick. Because you're more than two meters away from me. Sure, what's funny that's is that I, I don't think your video is coming up on the stream. Oh, people, no. are just, people are just hearing this rummaging, oh. and only I get to experience you putting on a silly hat and a mask over completely over your right. face. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can fix that. <laughs> I can fix that because I can just do this. What are you gonna do? Stop sharing. <laughs> there we go. Now, apparently, this is not a suitable type of mask to go into a garage or a corner shop in. I can't imagine why. I think it's completely normal, usual. Also, in here, it's really hot. Sorry. Oh, right. enough. Enough of the silliness. That's, that's rock and roll. That's absolutely not true. There will be plenty of silliness. Um, but I ain't no data scientist. 
Why do I need Jupyter Notebooks? Why do I need a clicker that works? Awesome. There we go. So who am I? My name's Rob. Uh, you will find me on the interwebs as SQL DBA with a beard, except on Twitter, where I'm SQL DBA with beard. Because when I changed my handle, uh, I didn't realize that Twitter only had a 15 character limit. So I became SQL DBA with a bear which was funny, so sort of kept it. And um, I'm nowadays, I'm a consultant. I just help people do stuff. I automate things. Um, I help, I train generally in the, in the data world, but anything to do with PowerShell, with automation, with Terraform, with CICD, with all of these good and wonderful things that we're doing. In the community world, I'm lucky enough, I'm, um, I'm a dual MVP. So I am a cloud and data center MVP as well as a data platform MVP. That's since uh, the beginning of July. Um, as we were talking about just now, I'm a co-author with Christy Lemaire for a book called DBA Tools in a Month of Lunches, which is out from Manning. You can see the link there on the screen. Uh, I write the, uh, the maintainer of the module DBA Checks, which is a validation for SQL Server estate using PESTA. Uh, I've also got a module called ADS Notebooks, which is very relevant to this um, presentation. So you're going to see some of that today. <laughs> and I'm really lucky because I live in the PowerShell community and the data community. Talking with Adam um, earlier on when we were not uh, streaming. Um, Adam's in Southampton running the, the PowerShell user group taken over from Jonathan Med. And yesterday I was um, at having, uh, having a meal with the people who run the data platform Southampton user group who I know really well. So I'm, I'm really lucky that I can live in both of, both of these worlds. What's failing me for some reason is my clicker. So we're talking about Jupyter. This, this is Jupyter. Uh, you can't see me because I'm not sharing my video, but <laughs> I'm pointing, this is video, this is Jupyter. And Jupyter, this is a picture of the South Pole of Jupyter taken by the Juno Flypast, but that's not the Jupiter that we're talking about. We're talking about this Jupiter, spelt with a Y. And there's a good reason why it's spelt with a Y. Firstly, because it evokes the planet Jupiter, a name that evokes traditions and ideas of science. Oh, yeah, yeah. We are going to get rid of the clicker because the clicker is not working. Um, Let's do secondly. Secondly, the core program languages are Julia, Python, and R. That's where it came from. And lastly, most importantly, I think, Galileo was the first person to discover the moons of Jupiter. And the way that he did it is a method of um, publishing research that has carried on to this day because he included the data that he made his judgments on with his publication. And that enables other scientific people to take that data, run the same uh, queries and work out if this is the same. Repeatability, rep reproducibility of the results. And for data scientists, that's very much what it's about. And Jupyter Notebook, that's where it came from. It came from the data scientists. People like Terry and Simon here. Um, if you want to know about data science and all of those things, these are the guys or these are some of the guys that you can go and see. I'd listen to their podcast, watch their YouTube videos, and you can learn an awful lot if you're interested in that sort of thing. But I ain't no data scientist. So what is a Jupyter Notebook? Well, Let's start off by going back in time a little bit, because the reason that you, who is not a data scientist, are going to be interested in Jupyter Notebooks 
actually begins here in 2006. In 2006, we were running PowerShell in a blue box. Here's our blue box. After a number of years of running PowerShell in this blue box, we got a new PowerShell in 2010. It was awesome, amazing. And this PowerShell you could run in a in a blue box. Yes, yeah, that's, that's okay. But the, you could also run it in a white box in in the ISE. I used to love the ISE. I spent loads of time in the ISE. It's a brilliant program. 2012, yeah, another new version. Guess what? Blue box. So we're still running in this blue box. ISE's got a little bit more. Got a new command add-on, which I never, ever used. I realized when I was putting this slide deck together that I just never, I, I would start it up a click close. Never show this again. Go away. Anyway, 2017. Oh, look at this. Special five running in a blue box. ISC's got a little bit more fancy. <sighs> Here we go. Now it's going to change. 2018. Everything's going to be wonderful now. Because 2018, we've got PowerShell Core, PowerShell version 6. It runs cross-platform. How amazing is this? Look, it's even got a black box for you to run in. Around the same sort of time, 2016, 2017, Visual Studio Code 1.0. The PowerShell version came in. There's David Wilson. May the 10th, 2017 is when he announced it on the uh, on the blog. Here we go. 2019, got another place where we could run PowerShell. Windows Terminal. Windows Terminal is fantastic. I really enjoy using it to open up all of the different versions of PowerShell all at the same time and maybe Jupyter and WSL and uh, Command Prompt and anything else that I want. There we go, Anaconda as well. Uh, Azure CLI, you can have all of those running in, in the Windows PowerShell. Uh, sorry, in the Windows Terminal. Amazing. But here's the problem. For a decade and a half, um, Houston, we've had a problem. And that's the correct quote, by the way. Go Google it if you wish to. But without a bit of effort, every single one of these CLIs that we're using to run our PowerShell has got this problem. Baked in, built in, design flaw from the very beginning. It's not a design flaw, but you, you know what I mean. Here we go. Let's look at Visual Studio Code. I'll make it even bigger so you can actually see where the problem is. And here's the problem. It's three o'clock in the morning. You're on call. System, really important, going to make all the suits shout and sweat and ring each other in the middle of the night to make sure that it gets fixed is broken. You are the person responsible for fixing it. You open up Visual Studio Code or any of the Windows PowerShell or Windows Terminal or any of those IDEs that you're using. And you run some code. You go through your troubleshooting guide. And maybe your troubleshooting says that this particular figure that we were looking for was 2,572. And you look in the notes and you say, oh, well, if it's 2,572, I need to do this. And you do this thing. And then you fix it in a hooray. It's all done. Eight o'clock in the morning, you're in work. Maybe it's virtually in work now, but we're in work. And we're having a wash-up meeting. And we're having a wash-up meeting with people with suits, Excel sheets with ticks in them. And we're working out what happened. How were we notified? Could we be notified any better? How did we fix it? Could we fix it in a better way? What can we learn from this experience? Or one of your colleagues, who probably had a full night's sleep, was able to enjoy a good coffee in the morning and a shower, 
didn't sleep through his alarm like you did because you were called out at three o'clock in the morning. He goes, oh, well, no, definitely didn't say 2,572. Because if it said 2,572, then the left-handed uh, sprocket waddle would have gone off as well. And they didn't go off. So, you know, you obviously had something wrong. Prove it. And you go, yeah, hang on a minute. I'll just go and look. But you see, the thing is, you press that button. And your results, they're gone. They're all gone. There's nothing you can do. Now, I appreciate that you could, say, use the transcript, or you could use logging, or you could, there are plenty of ways that you can make sure that you keep those results. But straight out of the box, you haven't got anything. So let's return back to our, <clears throat> excuse me a minute. Let's return back to our question. What is a Jupyter Notebook? There we go. It's a document that can contain text, code, images, and query results. Holy macaroni. Just imagine if you'd run this query in a Jupyter Notebook, you would have had the query results that showed that the figure was 2,572. And you could have gone to your colleague, yep, it definitely was. Look, here is my proof. Here are my results of the query that I ran. Everybody could see them. And that, for me, is the number one reason why, even if you're not a data scientist, you do need to use Jupyter Notebooks. Now I'm going to pause for a minute and I'm just going to see if anybody's going to jump in with any questions. Nope, we're all too shy. Good. So where can we get Jupyter Notebooks? Well, one place is Azure Data Studio. It's a cross-platform desktop environment for data professionals. Uh, hang on a minute. Doesn't it look just like Visual Studio Code, Rob? Well, yeah, it does. And there's a pretty good reason for that. Because Azure Data Studio is based on the code that Visual Studio Code is written in. So they're literally the same underneath, just Azure Data Studio has got a few more things that enable you to have pretty colors, because as I like to say, data people like pretty colors. It's not the real reason, but it's a good, good enough reason. So you can create notebooks. Now here it gets, now we're beginning to get a little bit complicated because we can have notebooks in Azure Data Studio and we can have .NET notebooks in Azure Data Studio. What's .NET notebooks? So .NET interactive notebooks were announced to Ignite, but the main blog post is um, from Maria in February. Everything that you've got in Jupyter Notebooks, your code, your text, your query results, but with added .NET PowerShell Core and C Sharp and F Sharp, as well as uh, Python and R and Spark and Scala and all of the data science type things. But it gets a little bit more confusing again, because just recently, I can't even remember how recently, but very recently, Tyler announced that there's a notebook mode in the PowerShell preview extension for Visual Studio Code. So there we've got another version of PowerShell notebooks. All right. That's the end of the slides. That's enough of the chat. Let's just see what we've got. 
So I am going to sit down because it's been a long day. Let's start at the end and let's start with, we don't want to see that anymore. Thank you very much. Let's start with this. So this is the public preview of notebook mode. So yeah, it's only uh, less than a week ago that Tyler announced this. And within Visual Studio Code, you can have a notebook. And what you need is you need to have Visual Studio Code Insiders at this version or higher, the latest PowerShell preview extension, this version or higher, and then set the visual code settings. So let's have a look at that. Where is my insiders gone? Ah, oh, yes. Change my resolution. There we go. So this is the latest Visual Studio insiders. And we are using the latest PowerShell preview extension. And within our settings, oops, let's just get rid of that a minute. Then you need to come up to this badger up here and open the JSON. And then you just add this in. And that enables you to have PowerShell notebook mode. What does PowerShell notebook mode give you? Go away, thank you. Let's take a script. Here we have a script. It's just a demo script I've got from a presentation a while ago. Um, and it's got some PowerShell. And in between the PowerShell, it's got, oops, it's got some comments. And when you have put that uh, setting in, then you get a book up here. Preview, enable notebook mode. Awesome. So this is just a just a PS1 file. So we can enable notebook mode and it turns the view into markdown at the top and our code. And we've got a little play button here. So we can set our set our location hey rob sorry to interrupt you mate. any chance you can zoom in a little bit i can zoom in all of the ways bit. brilliant because uh visual studio code all you need to do is control and plus Perfect. and then you've got all of the things so uh there's a little bug that we noticed if you haven't got the terminal open and you press that as far as you can see, nothing happens. So we do a control and single quote. You can see that actually it did run my code. It's just it never came up. Let's try something else. Let's open up the terminal. This is running Windows PowerShell and see where it runs that. In fact, let's see where it runs this. Interesting. So it's not running in the terminal. How does it run it in the integrated console? So it's going to run it in the integrated console. Uh, here we go. We can get our commands. What else have we got down here? Um, this is all stuff that you guys know, but uh, here we go. Yeah, we were talking. We were talking to Linux folks who were doing the cat said grep stuff. So I'm not going to run any of these, but you can see how you could do it. Now, here's another thing. If we turn Oops, let's not hit that button. Let's hit this button. Thank you. If we have a comment here, this will uh, show the version. And then we do that. Um, oh, yes, please save it. Thank you very much. Let's see what happens. Good. So it is actually keeping our comments that are within our code. But uh, here's our results. If we kill our integrated console, um, they're gone. We've got no results. So I'll be honest, I don't see what benefit this is giving us. Um, because if we can give a user and they understand that they can, oh, I've broken it. Come on, 
preview extension open up. If we can just give them a PowerShell um, script, then they can just see what's going on. There we go. Adam, I know in particular you were you were interested in this feature. Have you got any questions about this whilst we wait for Visual Studio Code to no questions, but do. definitely an observation. It looks like yep. it suffers the same sort of problem that you alluded to at the start, where if you close it, that's it, you've lost your results. You've lost that sort of history where you that you prefer in Jupyter Notebooks, where you can go back and look at your execution results. Yep, Abs absolutely. And 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 it's uh, executing it um, in the integrated console mm. down here. So. You know, sure. You know, we could, you know, we could just start. We couldn't start it like that, but we could start it like that. Start a transcript, and then we're going to get our results. Of course, we could. We, there are numbers of ways of doing it, but just we're just talking straight out of the box. So it's an interesting idea. I think there's probably going to be more features added to it in the future. I do think that it gives a little bit of confusion to people as to what they're. They, they should use. And of course, there's confusion with the two different types of notebooks. And let's have a look at the two, two different types of uh, notebooks. So I'm going to open Azure Data Studio. And in fact, Azure Data Studio, basically, it's like Visual Studio Code. You've got PowerShell. Everything is the same. So we'll do an F1 or Control, uh, sorry, Command, Shift, and P if you're on a Mac, or Control, Shift, and P if you're on a Windows. And if you type Notebook, you can just do a new Notebook. Here we go. Let's unsplit these, make life a little bit easier. And up here, we're going to have uh, change it to PowerShell. So we're going to change the kernel. And this is important to understand. This isn't a kernel like a like a Linux kernel. Uh, this is the kernel that is um, running the notebook. So you see that here we've got a number of choices. We've got SQL, we've got our .NETs, we've got PySpark, Spark, Python, all of these. These are what are kernels within the notebook sphere. You see that we're running a PowerShell one and we've got some buttons. We can add a cell, so we can add a cell just pick up a text cell. And in this now, we've got a nice little editor, which in the Zoom is slightly, that's interesting. Ha, huh. not noticed that before. Let me add content here. Wow. I love it when things go, go screwy. It's like it's bugged Very out. Good. It? Yeah. Isn't that funny? Interesting. Maybe kill that notebook and borrow it again. Uh, we'll just do this. So whenever anything goes wrong in Visual Studio Code or Azure Data Studio, we can do an F1 reload window. Even though those things weren't saved, look, still going to come back the same. Let's see what we get when it comes through. That now is the a first pro tip I'm taking away. That's brilliant. <laughs> I did not know that. Now you're going to lose your results, obviously, if you've got anything running in an in integrated terminal or in a terminal. But apart from that, you can just F1 and, and reload window, um, even your files, nice. even your un, even your unsaved files, like this this notebook we've got here. It's going to go. The first time that you try and start a PowerShell notebook, it is going to come up and say, "I want to install some Python." and I want to install some packages. And you've got to say yes. And it takes, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So you're going to have a little bit of a wait whilst you're, whilst you're doing that. The important thing here is use the default location that it gives you. I can't even show you. It's not on here. It gives you the option to either install by default in the user preferences sorry, use a home directory somewhere, um, or use an existing Python location. People who have used the existing Python location, I have had more queries about, why is this not working? Why is this gone a bit weird? So I would always say, use the one that it suggests that you, that you use. It's going to take a bit of time to install the first time, but then it's done. 
Right, let's see if we can. Yay, look at this. There we go. See, I should have just uh, just got my turn it off and on again. GIF ready. So what we've got here, we've got some text. So you can just type markdown. So you can do this is a heading and you're going to get the stuff on the side. And we say, well, this is the first line. And we'll hit enter. This is the second line. And you're getting a live preview over here on the right. And of course, it's Markdown. So Markdown is a bit like YAML, makes you love spaces because you don't just need one space. You need two spaces. Boom, there we go. Now we've got some code. Now, what we can do here is we can do all sorts of exciting things. And if we go and open a file, let's go to my GitHub folder and I go to presentations. So this is matching with this fella here. And here we've got presentations. So this is the same folder. So you can go and see this stuff. And I'm going to go to 2019 and I'm going to go to Berlin. Let's go to Berlin. And we'll just have a look at Markdown in SQL Notebook because this is a place where you can learn all of the lovely things that Markdown can do. So it shows you how to open it. Hang on a minute. Remember I said the best reason for having Jupyter Notebooks is because you keep your results. Here's another great reason. Documentation. Here is something that I have shared that you can use and you can put in to your Azure Data Studio and you can follow along and you can alter it, you can change it, you can do anything you want to, see how it works. Okay, here's one of my favorite things. So we've seen that, uh, let's come down here. We've got, so you've, you've seen that um, here that we've got a list. Numbered list. You start with any number that you like, because that means if you go in and edit it and you have a look, look at this. Over here, it says start with a one. After that, any number will do. It works the same when indented. It's a bit odd. It feels a bit strange because number, let's try it on that one because that's matching here. It doesn't matter. As long as whatever number you start with here, if we change this to a three, if we change this to a three. Oh, let's change that one to a three. If we change, come on, come on, mouse. I'm doing well today. If we change that to a three, uh, let's change that to a, what was it? it was there. We'll change that to an eight. Three, four, five, eight, nine, ten. Three, seventy-seven, eight, five, one, four thousand seven hundred eighty-nine. Now this number has got to be within an end, but it's a bit of fun. But that shows you how you can do lists. You can do links like this. You can embed images. This is how you embed an image. You can embed images to a local path, or you can embed images to a uh, any path. And here's a little trick that I used when um, relative linking didn't work. Um, you go to an issue on GitHub, any issue will do. Create a new issue, paste your image in. It's going to give you some markdown. Paste the markdown into your notebook, and you too can show a picture of a bloke when he had hair and not as much beard. It's really cool. Uh, you can add code. Um, it's just like you'd expect. It's one back tick or it's uh, four back ticks. And you can even put the language. And as you can see here, this has been, this one has been formatted as SQL and this one has been formatted as PowerShell. And you can blatantly see that there's a difference, can't you? Well, no, you can't because I, I've never been able to see any difference in them at all. You can also embed GIFs. Now, when I went to Berlin, I was going to go and see Metallica. So I figured I'm going to the Berlin user group. My mates who run it are also coming to Metallica with me. Let's have a bit of fun so we can have some Metallica gifts. So that's, that's really cool. Now you're saying, come on, so all, why, why we want to have, wouldn't have gifts in a notebook? Well, this is documentation. What about if I'd taken a screencast of some steps that I was taking? 
Many screencast software enable you to turn it into a GIF, which you can then embed within your notebook. Super, really useful. Anyway, let's come back to here. So we've got a PowerShell kernel. Let's write some code. So we can write some code. We'll just write yes version table. And look, we've got IntelliSense within our code block and we can hit play, hit run. There we go. Now we've got uh, PS version. And here is one little bugbear you might find about what I call not.net notebooks. On a Windows machine, the Python package that is running the PowerShell will use Windows version Windows PowerShell version 5.1. On a Linux, sorry, on a non-Windows machine, in effect, it's going to use PowerShell core. It used to be 6.2.0, but if you've got a later PowerShell package, it's gonna be 7.0.0, I think. Now, most of the time, that's not going to be a problem, but sometimes it will. There are going to be times when that's going to catch you out. As a PowerShell you know, expert user, you're going to be writing maybe a little bit more complicated PowerShell. You just got to be aware if you're using what I call not.net notebooks, that might just come up and bite you. So let's add another code block below. And I am going to ask Adam to give me a sentence. Look at this, see? A sentence. Hello, my yep. name's Adam, and this is a sentence. But what's interesting, I... right, before, before we do, I do actually have a question. In the PS version table, I can't help but notice at the bottom right, as an indicator, just like you get with VS Code, that you're actually running 7. And you're, and... Do you see what I mean? The, this one here? Yeah. Yeah, but that's that's for my, so if I do control single quote, it, it's just the like Visual Studio console. Code. Yeah. So this is for the integrated console here. So that's that's what that is in, in exactly the same way because it, it literally is the, the same thing. So what's used in the, in the notebook, within the notebook is a different engine. And it sounds like what, what Python uses. Yeah, it was, no, it's not even what Python uses. So what we're running here is Python, which is in, in which we have installed a package called PowerShell kernel. And this PowerShell kernel code is used to translate this code and then use either the Windows PowerShell, PowerShell.exe or PWSH gotcha. to run the code. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so it's happening here. Now you can see already that if we're doing all of this interpretation, then you know weird things can happen because weird things can happen. Anyway, so we've got this output now. There we go. So hello, my name is Adam, and this is a sentence. Nothing I could possibly have imagined that he is going to have said. So I'm going to save this notebook. I'm going to save it in C slash temp slash. Adam's notebook. I feel hey. famous. There we go. And I'm going to close the notebook. No, in fact, no, you know what? I'm going to close Azure Data Studio completely. Well, let's open it up again. Let's open up Azure Data Studio. Here we go. So we're going to open up Azure Data Studio. Uh, would I like to read the release notes? No, I would not. Thank you so much for offering though. And I'm going to let it just trundle through and start PowerShell because that'll make the next bit a little quicker. I'll close this panel. So we're going to file and open. And we're going to open C slash temp slash Adam's notebook. There we go. Right. So remember, I could quite easily have generated this. But here are my results. There's my PowerShell re results from something that I've just thrown away. So, okay, we've just used a silly example here, but imagine that this was, you know, I've got an incident, you know, either we've got an incident where we've got a runbook that we've created, or 
maybe we've just started it with, uh, yeah, um, in fact, let's actually start with Texel. Um, I was called out at 3 a.m. The service desk said important thing was bust. They didn't know what was wrong. Second line looked at logs. They said, huh? Well, I know. I was going to say, if your second oh, line staff line. look at logs, then you are spoiled. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm just making something up at the top of my head. <laughs> oh, no, cool third line. So, so I got called. This is what I did. Now, here's the thing. Now, you know, I have I was a production SQL DBA. Um, I've done on call for various different organizations. And I, you know, I've been called out at three o'clock in the morning. And what I would do is I would normally have a notebook or to write in like old fashioned with a pen and paper and stuff. Um, and then a little bit later, I'd use OneNote on a different screen and copy and paste screenshots. This is what happened. This is when it happened. This is the results that we saw. So, you know, you'd, you'd go through and you'd do this stuff. This is the queries that I run. It got all of this stuff so that we could understand what happened. And also so that when, you know, three hours into a major incident, somebody went, well, what did you do then? And you go, well, hang on a minute. Let me go back and find out. Because one of the skills in responding to incidents in in that manner is not just the way that you go about doing things, but it's also being able to remember the order you did things in and how you've progressed it. And that information is really, really, really useful the next time you get the same incident as a team or when you're trying to work out what happened and how to stop it happening. Now, literally, I don't do on call anymore, but um, I, I'm in organizations where people will say, oh, this is broken, can you have a look? I will literally open a notebook. All right, okay, let's go. Start typing stuff, start getting results. Start so working. Notebooks are your happen. main day-to-day -day driver. They are definitely, in, th in that particular scenario, absolutely. Yeah. Because I've got everything in one place. You know, I know the PowerShell that I'm going to write to gather the information, or I know the SQL that I'm going to write to gather the information. Um, and I, you know, I can then write down my, you know, what I'm thinking. Why did I choose to do this? All of that. They're all happening within within a notebook because then I save it, and I can attach it to an incident. We can talk about it, you know, or whatever. So really, really good. So let's move forward. Unless somebody, like seriously, if you got questions, just chuck them in the chat. We'll, we, you can distract me <clears throat> all over the place. Always happy to go down rabbit holes. I, I do have a curiosity. I really want to know sure. what that Adam's notebook looks like in Notepad. I have a feeling ah. that what we what you've done in the previous notebook, not the one we're looking at right now, is Oops. that you 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 executed oh. the right output and it effectively wrote it. Oh, how can I describe this? Do you, do you know what I mean? It effectively just wrote it as is, byte for byte, to the file, right? Pretty let's, much as let's, text. Let's let's do something else, right? Let's just do let's do GPS as well. All right, so we've got we've got something a little bit of interest. Here's here's one thing: we're not actually getting any results as we're going through, but you can see that it's spinning around and around, and it was even it was running. So thank you. So we've got this. So now we're going to save that. Okay, um, I'm not going to open it in Notebook. Uh, sorry, in Notebook. I'm not going to open it in Notepad. What I'm going to do is uh, but just something that doesn't interpret it as a Notebook. You know, just so I can look at yeah, the actual. Oh yes. Oh yes. The guts of it. Here we go. So we'll open it in code. Now you can, um, good. You can have Visual Studio Code with the notebook extension actually interpret as a notebook. Uh, you can see down here, it's asking me if I would like to do it. I don't like the way it looks in here and I, I use Azure Data Studio. So let's do a control F and we'll look for Adam. Wow. Here we go. So we've got this top one, there's our, Cell type is code. This is our markdown. And what is in the markdown was, uh, sorry, what was in the PowerShell, this code, Rob, this code there right in front of you, is write output, hello, my name is Adam. This is a sentence. Then we've got this thing that says outputs. What type is it? It's a stream, it's a standard out. And what we've got is text. Hello, my name is Adam. This is a sentence. I wish I was more creative. 
Yeah, but you weren't to, weren't to know, and that's you know that's half the fun. Here's the one where we did GPS. Now we've got our output. Again, it's given it to us as text because it it's text. It doesn't know that it's an object. And now we've got all of our processes running. And oh boy, oh boy, have I got a lot of processes running. My so it, word. it is effectively a a transcript, right? But a much more pretty and structured and easier to use, you know. Absolutely. But here's the other bit. Execution. Execution count. count. Now I wonder if this will live do it. If I do that, we'll get the processes again. I should have done the one above because it would have been quicker. But there we go. Let's go down to here. Now will you live update? Meh, boring. Let's open it again. Boink. Doof. Oh, I oh, know. I know why. I know why. Because I didn't save it. Boom. Two. So we know how many times we've executed this cell. What we don't know, if you're thinking, eh, can I make sure that my junior hasn't screwed something up and I want to know what they've run, is we don't know what was in here. Because quite frankly, I can put... Uh... Ooh, I, can't, I could even spell his name correctly like that. <laughs> and I could save that file. And if I come back to here... Uh, this one probably will need to be reloaded. Uh, don't reload the window. Just shut it and reopen it up. Open recent. There we go. There we go. So apparently I ran Adam is famous mm. and um, uh, it gave me the processes on my machine. Okay. So here's another point. Um, if this is a list of your Active Directory accounts or your machine names or um, stuff that you really shouldn't be passing around, um, yeah, it's just sat in a JSON file here, which is not much good to anybody. So it, you can, of course, now we can do Control H and we can replace Adam with Rob and save it. And we can go back and again, Azure Data Studio doesn't regenerate it, but we'll go through to there. Here we go. Hello, my name is Rob. This is a sentence. Rob is famous. Hello, my name is Rob. This is... So you can go through and replace it. And there's something that you really should consider if you're passing through. Here's another thing. I know for a fact that the uh, Microsoft Azure Data team are using notebooks as their support methodology. Oh, here's a great way that you can use a notebook. Microsoft are doing it. If you open a support call in Microsoft, I had something wrong with this thing in Azure SQL Database. Okay. Here is a notebook. Please can you run it with the results, save the results, sanitize it if you need to, and send it back to us, please. You run the queries. It gathers the information they need. Save it send it back to Microsoft. For us over here in the UK, we're now not playing tag team overnight because we're in different time zones. If we're having to deal with the team in Seattle, we can just send them the information. They don't need to sit. We don't need to do screen shares. We don't need to get approval. We don't have to go through security to allow people into the estate to be able to do that. They can get the information they need. They can send it back. You can do exactly the same. Super, super idea. Anyway, let's go back to this one. Type into your bar.net interactive notebooks. Hit enter. Use whatever search engine you want. This is going to come up. .net interactive is here. And this is a blog post by Maria, who's a PM on the .NET, uh, .NET Interactive team, I think. And it's going to give you some steps that you need to follow to enable you to have .NET Jupyter Notebooks. So we're 
you can read yourself you can follow these instructions just follow them carefully there's a couple of points in here where ooh, that looks lovely doesn't it uh where is it um uh, okay i thought it was on there there's a couple of spots where the path isn't available in between one of these three and you you end up with a little bit of fun and games but you could also do sql dba with a beard uh it's here there we go and i do pretty much the same thing with a few screenshots um yeah sometimes new things have errors so there we go there's there's the error that i had uh, threw me for a little bit but that's how you can you can fix it so once you have followed those instructions then you can open uh windows terminal and um i love windows terminal because you can put all sorts of backgrounds on it so um adam why is that the background for this particular cli ci yeah for the command prompt why 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 is that the background why i don't know <laughs> That's how that's how old it is. That's when it was released. No way. CMD. Oh yeah. Really? Way. Way as a as a very famous man said, probably around that time. Way. Um <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'll make myself giggle now. So we will open up Anaconda and we will CD to uh C slash let's see slash user slash mr rob slash one driver really should put these things in somewhere a little bit better than this github let's leave it there because i can't remember oh brilliant oh yeah that'll be because it's documents I tell you, there is one absolutely okay. amazing module that will help you in this exact scenario. It's called Z location or Z location, whatever you want to call it. We're running in the Anaconda prompt. Of course. So weird things happen, which is infuriating because over here, I would have just gone like that <laughs> and gotcha. I'm in the, in the right place. But uh, yeah, that's that. anyway, so I do that because it makes it a little bit easier to get to. And then you type Jupiter with the wrong um, letter, and then you say lap. Boom, enter. And some stuff, I, oh, interesting. Yes, please open this in Edge. What we've got, I'll just minimize that a minute. So what you've got is you can see the Jupyter extension has loaded. This is where it's loaded from. And uh, now we're running on local host, so you can actually copy this file if you want to or paste one of these in but it will as you saw open up a browser when you open up a browser you get to this page here and here we have our jupyter running in a browser and you've got a console so you can run .NET powershell this is my favorite bit this is where rob forgets which key does which so i'm going to press enter which is the wrong thing to do so i press shift and enter there we go, PS version table. So we're using PowerShell version 7.0.0. And if we do uh, get module, oh, shift and enter, I'm going to do that a lot. You see, by default, we've got these um, modules available to us. And if we do this and select, is it module base? Shift and enter. See, every time. There we go. So you can see that our, uh, let's make that a little bit easier. So up and down, that still works. Let's do that. Shift and enter, good work, Rob. Um, so you can see that what we are doing here is we're loading our WS man, our utility, our security, our management modules, and they are coming from this folder in my profile. So dot, dot net folder tools store microsoft.net interactive one point blah 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 microsoft.net interactive as opposed to if we open 
PowerShell 7 and did um, base. You see, these are all coming from the sort of paths that you would expect. There's my read line, there's my program files, normal, normal sort of paths. And also this is version 7.0.3. This is version 7.0. So your Jupyter Notebook for .NET Interactive Notebooks is running its own PowerShell 7. So even if you don't have PowerShell 7 on the machine at all, if you install the .NET Interactive stuff following that blog post, you're going to end up with PowerShell Core running within the Jupyter environment. And as you can see, we just got, this is just a shift and enter. This is just a console we could run. So we will close that. And we've got this notebook here. So we've got a whole bundle of stuff that we do. So we do .NET Interactive. Now you can choose between a code or raw or markdown. You can put things in here, start running. You can also investigate your own um, repositories. There we go. So we could just go and pick a .NET notebook. Uh, maybe you could look at you know something like this. Double click. There we go. So if your users are confident enough to have Jupyter Lab running, now we've got something running in a browser that is now going to have some information about how to create some stuff. This is about setting up DBA tools to use it in a container that we've already got. Um, that's not actually going to create it. So we will do a shift and enter on our code. There we go. And we've actually just got our output here literally running our code within a browser experience that'll enable our users to work. So it's really neat. It's a really cool way of doing it. But I'd much rather work in Azure Data Studio. So there's a little bit of a blip in Azure Data Studio. So we're going to do this reload. Oops, we're going to do this reload window again. So we're going to start off with a Mm, just wonder, let's see what happens. Because one of these is actually a .NET notebook. So to get .NET Interactive Notebooks running in Azure Data Studio, you need to have the latest version of Azure Data Studio. And you need to go to settings and you need to type kernel and tick this box, show all kernels for the current notebook provider. Then when you come to here and you drop it down, you're going to see that you've got .NET and .NET C Sharp and .NET F Sharp. And oh, hang on a minute, they don't show up. But all you have to do, change the kernel just to one of the ones that's there. Once it's changed, I chose the wrong one. There we go. Then it comes up. So it's a little, little bug. They're going to fix it, but it's just so that you know how to do it. Now we can change to... .NET PowerShell, and if we do this, we run our PS. Oops, let's actually type in there, Rob. We do PS version table. Bingo, there we go. You see, actually, I think this runs just a little bit smoother, a little bit nicer. It's a little bit squizzier. Squizzier, is that a good word? I don't know. Um, the other good thing about this is if we go and, oops, let's go to the right place. There we go. Uh, if we go to something like, let's look at DPHX PR. We'll look at the notebooks that I've used when I've created a PR in the past. Uh, let's pick 750 and do that. Beautiful thing about .NET Interactive Notebooks. The output is color coordinated. Look at that, beautiful. Your pester looks like pester. Um, in not.NET notebooks, then it doesn't. It's just grayscale, which is a bit of a bit of a blow. So you'll notice here in my Jupyter Notebooks repository, I've got .NET notebooks and I've got not.NET notebooks. I've got a whole bundle of stuff in there that you are welcome to use and abuse and do whatever you like. Um, and in fact, Here's another cool thing about why you should have .NET Notebooks. Holy macaroni, would you look at that. This is just a gist. 
in that gist. We have our notebook, we have our results, we have our code. This is a SQL one, but it doesn't matter. There are our results again. So this means that you can do things like this. So let's find, um, well, go back even further. Your friend says, how do I do this thing? Oh, look at this, it's way back. Um, Ah, that's because it's not in there. Lab.com, <laughs> SQL DBA with the beard. Here we go, Jupyter Notebooks. Notebooks. Uh, .NET Notebooks for Bob. Here we go. So, your friend says, you're a PowerShell person. Well, oh, I can't get this to work. It's not working as I'm expected. Look, why when I put in a write output in my function, do I not get my files? Well, because the first thing that's coming out is your write output, Bob. But you can show him, you can give him a notebook. He can read it on GitHub. It gets rendered with the results, it all makes sense. But he can also open it himself and can run the code. Look at this. Um, oh yeah, the link. The, yes, that file that doesn't exist. Good work, Rob. Uh, let's try that one. There we go. There we go, we can run that. A thing, another thing, yeah, another thing. Maybe this is progress. So you can give him some code that he can run himself and maybe you can change it. So it's like, oh yeah, echo Adam is famous. My word, you're going to be so famous. There we go. Go do that. I run that. Come on. There we go. Adam is famous. And some stuff as well. Oh, yeah. So that was create some files. Good work. But it's another way that you can show things. You can demonstrate them. You can give them to other people. Here is another use for notebooks. Fabulous. I'm going to give you one more use case for notebooks because realistically, by now, I think you're probably thinking they're pretty cool. But you're thinking, oh, I've got to go and create all of this stuff. Well, as it happens, from the cold. There's this guy called Andrew. Andrew is fantastic and he has. Uh, done a lot of work with Docker containers. So you want to run SQL Server and Docker containers, definitely come and look at him. And Anthony Nocentino, one of those two is going to be good. Um, and he has got, is this the one that I want? Uh, no, that's his demo. Oh, maybe he's not published it. Let's go and check. SQL Server and Containers Guide and a wiki. So, SQL Server and Containers Guide. Ah, it's because he's pinned them. There we go. Let's look at it this way. SQL Server and Containers Guide. So he's got this and it has a wiki. There we go. So he's created a wiki with all of the information, quick start. Here we go, look, got some contents. Get up and running with a SQL Server. And this is a markdown document and it's got some markdown and then it's got some code and then it's got a picture and then it's got some code and then it's got a picture and then it's got some, and he's looking at it saying, can you just read through this? Does it make sense? Have you got any examples? You know, any improvements we can make? And, uh, and I looked at this and I went, well, hang on a minute. We've got some documentation, we've got some code some pictures what's this sound like sounds like it should be a notebook so i went well i got uh it's not in there it's in the sql collaborative 
in the SQL Collaborative, I have created an ADS notebook module, which is for creating Azure Data Studio new notebooks with PowerShell. Cool beans. This module only contains three commands at present. That is, in fact, a lie. And I will tell you why it's a lie right now, because we are going to do this. Uh, in fact, in fact, let's let's do it even. Let's be even more cool. Let's be even more cool. How cool should we be in Southampton? PowerShell Gallery. Um, here we go. And uh, we'll go ADS notebook. Here we go. So we're in version uh, 23rd of July, point one. Okay. Right, let's fix that. So we're just going to commit our change. And then we're going to push it. There we go. So we're going to let that do its stuff whilst we carry on. So you can see that now it actually has four functions. So it's got convert ADS GitHub wiki to notebook as well. And that means that you can take the SQL Server and Containers guide and his wiki. So this is just the wiki page, it's just as Markdown. And in the SQL Server and Container Guide, we've got Notebooks folder, nothing in .NET, nothing in not.NET. So now what I can do, if I close that, I'll create Notebooks page. So uh, I can't remember if I've loaded this function. So I'm just going to do that just to make sure. So we've got the wiki location and the Git location. And we've got where do we want our notebooks to be generated? We're going to copy all of our images over so that they're going from where they're created in the wiki into the code. And then we're going to get all of the markdown pages out of the wiki. And then for every page, we're going to convert the GitHub markdown to a .NET PowerShell and to a PowerShell notebook. And of course, we're good and dutiful PowerShell people. So we're going to run as a what if just in case, because you know we write good code that's got what if for both all picked in. And this is going to create us .NET PowerShell notebook in this location. Um, oh, we don't have anything in container networking. All right, let's have a look at container networking. Ah, there we go. That's why we don't have that. So we're happy that that's going to create what we want. We're going to take away our what ifs. It's all good practice. And we'll do that. And boom, you saw how quick that worked. There we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 containers. And it took less than half a second to do it. All right, my machine's fairly speedy, but I still think that's impressive. Yeah, uh, really. Come on, Rob, prove it. What have we got in here? Okay. Let's have a look. So we'll go GitHub, clone and forked. SQL Server and Containers Guide, Notebooks. Uh, we'll look at .NET 1, uh, persisting data. There you go. So here we've got the code that he's got. If we look, uh, if we look at his, oops, if we have a look at his wiki, Persisting data, there we go. So far in this guide, we've gone to this. So far in this guide, we've gone through this. And then we've got some code that we could run. So we could run that one, because there we go, Docker volume LS. Now I've got the markdown that he's used. And I've created a .NET notebook and you know, just for um, brown stuff and giggles. If we go and have a look at the not.net one, uh, pick running your first container. There we go. We've got some code we could run. There we go. Docker search, MS SQL, and we're getting all of our results. So I've turned his wiki with all of this good information into something that anybody can use to follow along. I've got some plans to do some other stuff as well, but we'll we'll keep that alone.
So this module, there we go, has automatically been um, generated. We've got the new version there. The new version is going to have, uh, there we go. Yep, we've got our new function available there. Other things that it's got is a new ADS workbook and a new ADS workbook cell, and they basically just work together. So uh, let's go to that. So this is our ADS workbook code. And as you can see, what we can do is create ourselves our intro cell and our DBA tools. And we've got a second cell. That's going to be installation. Third cell is going to be some code. Fourth cell is going to be getting help. We turn those into workbook cells, the text or maybe code, and then we turn all of those into a workbook, right? And that works just like this. Uh, DBA tools for Adam, because I've no idea when the last time was that I ran this. Um, and we'll do that. And just because, and I literally have never done this because uh, .NET PowerShell, I have no idea what's going to happen with this, but I'm going to try it. Uh, we'll call that one that. And we'll do this. And now we're going to go over here and who knows what's going to happen? Because I literally don't know. Uh, we'll go to C temp. Uh, order by date modified. Let's open that one. Don't know why he didn't just select both of them. What did we just open that one? Let's open that one. There we go. Just generated our notebooks, both a, a .NET and a not .NET one just out of the blue. Lastly, I'm going to show you that in my, uh, no, don't save anything. In my um, repository today, I added these things. So uh, Adam, we were talking about Jess earlier. So Jess wrote a blog post about how you can use get win event, yes please, to investigate what happened in the past on our server. Well, as it happened, I needed to do something like that. And it turned into something that was actually quite useful for me. And so what we can do is, uh, let's not do that one because that one can take ages. Do that one. Yeah. Desktop. We've got our notebook. And we've got all of the code that Jess has given us. And as quickly as that, well, we've just read our event log and got our information out. Super duper. But it also gives me a chance to show you this bit of code. By default, the notebook's max width in the output is 120, I think. So when you have you know, an output that goes across like that, it can all get squashed. So what this bit of code does is it just resets that output to all of the stuff. Right, I have run out of things to say. Um, I, I could keep talking for about this until tomorrow because as you can tell, I love it. It's awesome. <laughs> but um, do we have any questions? No, um, I do. Uh, there's, there's none in the chat, but I I'm definitely have some questions. Okay, go for it. So demystify for me the, the, the term Jupyter and all this, because I've seen Azure Data Studio and you use notebooks, and, I'm, and I've seen you launch .NET Interactive as a web service, that spawned a web service, and you did it in the browser, but you did explain at the start, but I'm still kind of a bit hazy. What is Jupyter and how does that fit into this interactiveness that we've seen? So Jupyter is a... Um, uh, the best way of because I still see it at the top in the title there, right? So it says Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, yeah, it says it says Jupyter Notebooks simply because um, I'm 
does it say it just because I'm in that folder? Yeah, uh, it says it because I am in this folder here. Gotcha. So that's the that's the only reason okay. that it's that it's displayed up here in the top. Um, so Jupyter Notebooks is running. Um, so as you saw, we're running in Python because Anna, Anaconda is a version of Python. Okay. And your Jupyter installation is part of that Python and it enables you to generate these notebooks is I think the best way of putting it. Not only generate, create, use them, actually put them into, um, into the browser as the web service. So it's the thing, it is the thing that's doing that work. So in Azure Data Studio, if, you, if, if I was going to install it now, because I don't, do I need to get involved with having Anaconda and Python installed? Ah, right. So to have that interactiveness just, just remember like I, you've shown in only Azure Data Studio. Remember, remember how I said it was slightly confusing. So if we just want to have, let's pick a normal, Azure Data Studio notebook, what I have called not.net, because these are the ones that are just running Windows PowerShell 5.1 on Windows machines and uh, PowerShell Core 7.0.0 on non Windows machines, mm -hmm. running at the PowerShell package, the PowerShell kernel package, which takes the code that we've written and, and uses the PowerShell XE or the Posh XE to then. Uh, to to run it, and then brings back the results and interprets them and puts them out on the notebook. So the normal Azure Data Studio notebook that comes with Azure Data Studio, the first time that you start a PowerShell or uh, in fact um, Spark or Python um, notebook, it will come up in this side and it will say, "I need to install Python." I understand now. Okay. All right. So your machine will then have Python running. Now, if you've already got Python, you use the default location that it says. Don't use your existing one because there lies pain and package collisions and all sorts of fun. And you just don't want it. It's just much easier just to keep them keep them separate. So this is where your um, Python is running for that. That is what it's going to use. This. This kernel is going to be running the PowerShell, but you can see here that we've got um, these packages, Jupyter Core, Jupyter Console, Jupyter Client, Jupyter. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that are helping Azure Data Studio generate this, gotcha. be able to run that. Okay. Now, if you want to have, uh, no, don't save that. If you want to use a .NET PowerShell notebook, you must have followed the steps mm -hmm. in uh, Maria's blog post, which I had up somewhere before. Uh, I obviously didn't. Um, this one. You must have followed these, these steps. These are going to install uh, .NET 3.1 SDK, Jupyter, with Anaconda. Gotcha. So it said, and then in the Anaconda prompt, yeah, that's what we opened here in um, Windows Terminal. Then you check what kernels you've got. Then you move to a normal command prompt, and then you install .NET Interactive. Then you go back to your Anaconda prompt, and then you install the Jupyter for the .NET Interactive, and then it'll install C Sharp, F Sharp, .NET PowerShell. Gotcha. That that definitely does demystify for me. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. 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 What do we have here? Um, yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Oh, can't read your your username. Yeah. Jupyter is a collection of services collaborating to execute the notebooks, mostly bits of Python and JavaScript. JavaScript. <laughs> but yes. Thank you very much. Um, that's, that's a much better way of explaining it than I did. No, I, I fully get it now. It's, it's the Azure Data Studio is, is no more than VS Code in this sense, and and and, and, and Jupyter and, and Python. Well, uh, Jupyter on top of Python is what drives that sort of interactiveness, right? Gotcha. 
Can I run notebooks in Visual Studio Code also? Right, so yes, you can. Let's have a look. We've got Adam's notebook here. Um, and oh, I can't remember how to do it. So is this separate to what Tyler showed? <clears throat> yes, so this is Visual Studio Code. Uh, let's see if I think if I do this, if I need control O and open Adam's notebook, there it is. And hopefully it's going to come up with a thingy that tells me again. Oh, beast. If in doubt, reload window. There we go. Tip, you can change the Python interpreter used by the Python extension by clicking on the Python version in the status bar. Excellent. Clicking on the Python version. Oh, is that only going to do that? That is only going to do that. So we need to go to settings and notebooks. And Oh, this is this is my favorite thing. You can tell that I never use it on here. Is there is a there we go. Automatically open them in the notebook editor. So if I do that, oh, there oh, we go. Wow. So the answer to your question, who was that, Constantine? Is yes, you can, absolutely. But I would say if we do a Control O and we open dpa tools ah oh, we can't open dotnet once uh, there we go let's try the not dotnet one awesome it works perfectly <laughs> <laughs> If in doubt, reload. Um, here we will try that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Python extension loading. It's going to load Adam's state book. It's not going to load the DBA tools one. Really interesting. So that Adam's um, notebook one then, can you execute these bits? Like we yeah, saw in yeah. Azure Data Studio. Yeah, you absolutely can. And you... Uh, yes, trust this one. There we go. And then we've got run cell. Interesting. Fail to start the session. Look at the log for details. Ha, it died. My kernel died. <laughs> well, I was about to say that looks a lot more. That looks a lot better than what the preview extension had to offer, in my opinion, because the results were given to you there and then in the mid, in the body of the editor, as opposed to the integrated console. So it makes me think, why did they? So we see up here, it thinks it's doing something. Um, <laughs> what can I say? We'll give it one more go. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, you got to install a .NET interactive notebook extension for .NET. Uh... Oh, for the other one you you initially tried opening. Okay. Uh, which one, Constantine? Hmm. So to, uh, to be honest, this is why I don't use it. Python extension loading. Jupyter server started. No, it's still busy.
No. Um, uh, to be honest, now see, it's not going to start. It's it's a certain thing. To be honest, I like it in Azure Data Studio because it works more reliably. I'm not going to say it's perfectly reliable. There are there are definitely bugs in this thing. It's brand new. All sorts of exciting things happen here and there, but it is um, it it does does work more reliably. And I use this in clients. I give this to um, you know give this to teams and say here you go. Um, uh what have we got oh yeah um something that's going to work for here oh yeah parachute seven um yeah how can i create objects from text so tobias is uh the guy that ran, wrote isc steroids one of the organizers of the parachute conference europe and i've taken one of his blog posts and um created it so you can actually show people look this is how you can work through and use things Service desk instructions. Yeah. <laughs> service instructions. Uh, and yes, I, I do write service desk, desk instructions that say things like that in them. <laughs> I also write <laughs> PowerShell code that will create errors that say things like the beard is sad. <laughs> because why not have some fun as long as the information gets through. But um, I'd rather do this. Oh, look, Constantine knows all of the answers. Then you've got to create. So, okay. So in Visual Studio Code, as long as I've got .NET Interactive installed, I can create a new notebook by going new notebook, change the kernel because there's a strange little bug, and then do .NET PowerShell. Or I can install the .NET Interactive Notebook extension and then create a .dib file and then convert it to a normal notebook format. It, yeah, I'm with you, Constantine. I think I'll take the Azure Data Studio one all of the time. Um, and then you open it in Azure Data Studio. I've got a feeling that Sean Melton blogged or tweeted somewhere that if you create a notebook in Azure Data Studio, it won't open in here for some reason that makes that made no sense because he said as far as he could see it was identical but there we go so it's 9 p.m my time hmm. thank you very much all 9423 oh no 14 people that are here <laughs> it's been lots lots and lots of fun um yes i'm really glad rachel because Absolutely, all I want to do is give you ideas of things that you can do. So, yep, you can you can you can use ADS to to run your PySpark from a common remote console. Definitely, you could you would be able to to use it in that way. Um, yeah, please take these ideas, go and do cool things with them. Go to my GitHub, steal all of my code, make use of it in however you feel fit and the only thing that i ask is that you let me know the cool thing that you're doing for no other reason than it it's always so awesome to see what people do when they take your code and go off and put it into do other things um and keep your eye on the ads notebook that was kind of cool we just literally released the new version of that with the new um, function in it and we will um, I will come up with some good ideas of some other stuff that I can do converts for I'm so, still incredibly shocked on how smoothly that went for you that you just committed and you clearly had a pipeline and you did it live and it just went straight to the gallery like a lot uh, of people yeah. would just be so fearful of you know doing anything like that in a live session yeah, yeah but if it goes wrong it goes wrong I mean yeah. to, to be honest that's a, that's, that's another part of it. No, no, SQL Collaborative to come back to me. Um, so yeah, I've, I have I have faith because um, I've built the pipeline that does um, DBA checks, which uses PESTA and AST to mm -hmm. validate that the PESTA that we've written is correct for the PESTA that's in the module. Uh, you know, so you end up in a bit of um, inception. This one is pretty simple because all we're doing is um, a GitHub action. Yep. There we go. Great.
thanks. Hmm. Thanks for that. That's that's really handy. That thank you. Um, but yeah, it's just just an action pinging through. So yeah, that's what I do. A CICD. So I was uh, pretty confident that it would just just go through and and work. So who do you have on next on the Southampton Parachel user group? Well, let me change scene to uh, the final one where um, it's Jonathan Allen next. And that's on Wednesday, the 19th of August. Um, same time. Father Jack. Father Jack. Uh, quarter past seven in the evening. And he's doing a PowerShell medley session, right? Um, where he pretty much takes a bunch of sessions from the community that they choose um, that you, you want to see him go through um, so there's a one question survey that you can fill out from a list of topics there's easily a couple of dozen topics to choose from choose as many as you like and the most popular Jonathan will chew through in in the allotted time um, and yeah that, that's in a couple of weeks time on a Wednesday um, you can catch the, uh, the the link to the said survey at the meetup so if you go to psouth.co.uk or redirect to the meetup you'll find Jonathan's next scheduled event um, and the, the link to the survey um, but yeah definitely don't miss out on that um, but as we're wrapping up um, got a few things I just want to run through and say obviously thanks everyone for tuning in massive thanks to Rob for an excellent session. I felt, I felt it was pretty, very engaging. Um, call to speakers. Yeah, anybody wants to present, get in touch. Um, grab me on Twitter, Coda Amok is my handle. If you want to present for whatever you like, reach out. Um, subscribe to the channel, join the meetup group, and uh, the next session, which I've already gone through. So, um, Rob, thank you so much. That was that was fantastic. Oh, let me switch back to you because you've okay. actually you're actually filling out the. Uh... Oh yes, did you not? Yeah, just switch back. So that's what? it. Yeah, so if you go switch to meetup, yeah. like you have, yeah. So what I, all I did was I went to psouth.co.uk, mm -hmm. and we ended up on the meetup page. So choose that one, mm -hmm. and then there's a link. Perfect. Here we go. Which sessions do you want to see more from Jonathan? Just zoom in a bit. Oh, it's, it's got not, plenty he... there. Yeah, he's not even got a four other. That would have been a shame. Oh, what, sorry? Jonathan is a, 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 another. <laughs> Jonathan oh, is a good I mate see. of mine, so I, I could have put something something daft in there. <laughs> um, splatting. We definitely want to see splatting. Uh, event logs and filtering. Um, let me see. Securing your files. Yeah, that's good. Um, so Jonathan, very... uh... Sorry, go on. Go on. Keep going. Just, I was just going to say, I, I was very interested to see what Jonathan would, would if he does the session, if he chooses it, you know, it's the sys internals and using, um, it's the, the byte wise or operators. So the, the V or the V, V uh, those ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah, those, V's, yeah, those are, because every time I see examples of those, my head hurts. <laughs> so Jonathan, Jonathan and I rode from Exodus to Dawlish and back a couple, three weekends ago. Um, and we're, we're, we're riding along and he's like, so how do you keep credentials safe? Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> and I literally had to ask him to slow down. <laughs> it's like, can you just slow down a minute and then I can actually talk <laughs> without trying to pedal like a lunatic whilst we're doing it. Yeah, because there's, there's uh, a new security module, right? Yes. Yes. It's awesome. But yeah, we'll, um, uh, we'll save that for Jonathan. Yeah, we will, but we'll also do this because because why not? Oh yeah, notifying team channel of a SQL agent job result. That was fun. Um, Did you blog it? Is that what you're? This 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 is this is my blog put my blog SQL DBA with a beard, and what I'm looking for is my history of stuff. Where is it? There it is. Um, there we go. So that conversation literally led to this. Uh, uh, there's yeah. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> No, yep, that, so that is... heading straight away is captivating for me because that is exactly how I manage. Well, yeah, but it's his fault. <laughs> it's Yap's fault. Because <laughs> everybody knows if you want to store secrets for your staff, you follow Yap's, Yap's blog post. Except, no, you don't. You've got this secrets management. And, in fact, um, 
that's the other thing that I've got. I have, I've got one more blog post in my head that I need to write about about it. Oh, sorry, that's probably making people slightly dizzy, but uh, notifying teams. Here we go. So you want to be able to run your application as your um, user account. And um, oh, look, guess what? Rob used a notebook <laughs> in his blog post oh, to demonstrate. I remember this now. Yeah, because I, I remember I tweeted back and I was like, oh, it's not loading. It doesn't load on your mobile. So if you're trying it doesn't load on the mobile. mobile. Yeah. yeah, I didn't I didn't realize that. So I'm, I'm not going to do that again. I'm, it's, just, <laughs> it's a real shame because it was like, is this a really neat idea? And then it's like, yeah, it doesn't work on a mobile. Ah. <laughs> But yeah, um, in fact, as you can see, you, you literally see that it came from that conversation. But yeah, use the um, uh, secret management uh, module, and it's you know it's in preview. But you can get and set your secrets, and you can even um, it uses your own local key vault, but you can also use uh, Azure Key Vault with it as well. So it's really really neat, and I'm hopefully he's got a super super demo. When you say local key vault, you mean like credential manager? Is that what you mean? Oh, here we go. It's going to show us his password for his Twitter account. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, uh, oh, okay. So, so the, just basically a directory with the keys. That's, it. that's what you mean by key vault, right? Uh, no, I mean it is a it's a it's a proper it's a proper key vault, but this is your built-in local one. Um, the... Oh, I didn't tell it which. Oh no, there we go. Um, so there we go. So this has grabbed it from both the vaults. Huh. Um, so yes, let's let's get a surprising fact. There we go. Get secret. This name to a vault could uh, be in Azure. That's quite surprising. Handy. Oh, it's a secure string. Mm. Let's see it as plain text. A house cat can reach speeds of up to thirty miles an hour. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is this is actually an Azure key vault that sat um, up there, and I've got secrets that are in a pipeline and I can get them or set them, create them from my machine here, but I can use them within um, Azure DevOps pipelines. So I can use an SPN, so service principal name to be able to mm -hmm. um, run my pipeline to be able to have permissions to do stuff that I'm not allowed to do to, you know, all of that good stuff, but I can actually go and grab the secrets out of uh, Keyvault. But I'm not doing a key vault session. That's for um, yeah. We digress. <laughs> we yeah. Like, you can you can see how how simple is it if, to 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 drag Rob off to into something something crazy. <laughs> just just read the blog post. I think is the message to everyone. Yeah. yeah. I think I'll read that. Have fun. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, I'm going to do this. Oh, I switched out. Let me switch back. What are you there doing? There we go. So I have switched off my thing. And then, I don't know, are you going to show the video? Mm -hmm. Yep, just switch back. Da, da, da. Look at this. Like I say, thank you, everybody. Have a great night and goodbye. Nice. Thank you very much. Take care, folks. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>